Welcome back to the Talking Scheme Podcast. This week we have a guest host, Michael. I'm your guest host, Michael, and this week we have the one, the only, the man, the myth, the legend, Scheme Guide is on the show. He's going to be telling us all he knows about the run and shoot offense, and this man not only has he taught me everything I know about football, but he has to countless people around the world, and he's built himself into the foremost resource for football scheme, and especially the run-and-shoot offense. So we've got a real treat being able to pick his brain today. Uh, scheme guy, thank you so much for the time. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Uh, so I want to start from a foundational level. Uh, how'd you get started into, into football? I started way back in the year 2000, and actually it was before that. It was the year 1998. I started way back in 1998, and I went out for the JV team in eighth grade. I was at a private high school, middle school combo, and I ended up getting put at nose tackle and and left tackle, a role I'd kind of play for the next several years as I went on into – high school and and that's kind of where I played and I I fell in love with the sport and the more I played it the more I understood it I I had watched it growing up and I had grown up an Oilers fan but early in my my when I was about 11 they split town and decided to go to Nashville and for me uh, it tore my heart out that, that Oilers team in the early 90s, I had loved watching them, but I didn't really understand what was going on. And then when I started playing in eighth grade, I started to really start to understand a lot of the, the stuff. And I started looking into Buddy Ryan and the 46 Bear. And I started getting into these different ideas like that. As I got older, I started playing the QB Club games for the N64. And then that moved on to Madden. Eventually, I played NFL Fever. And by maybe two Madden 04, I think was Madden 03 was the first year I was like all in on Madden. And I was always trying to run something like a realistic offense and defense. I loved learning about football and trying to apply it to that Madden world. As I was going into college, I, I kept studying more and more. And I got involved a little bit at the school I played at. We were a 6A uh, state championship runner-up several years in a row. I think we, we went to the state championship the, at the top level in Florida. My senior year, we played against uh, Dwayne Bowe, and uh, they had a guy that ran a 4-2-6 that hadn't caught a catch all year. He was just a track player that was a backup, but in that game, he ended up catching the game-winning catch and on a long bomb and ah, I, I'll remember that for the rest of my days I was the biggest kid tallest kid growing up my whole childhood and I was a behemoth in that JV squad but by the end of varsity I was kind of pedestrian in terms of height and size and whatnot and I realized you know I wasn't going to be getting a scholarship I wasn't going to be going on to play further so I moved on with other things and pursued my career and volunteered a little bit on the side with my old alma mater and did some of their film work and started recording the practices for coaches and for filming the games, stuff like that, and getting involved in other ways. Uh, as I was getting older, I started researching more and more into this new offense that was out there called the Air Raid that was taking over. I've been watching Texas Tech a lot because – I loved watching Hawaii because it was the run and shoot. And I had always had an affinity for the run and shoot since those Oilers days. And so I would watch Hawaii, but Hawaii was coming on TV at one in the morning. And it wasn't always easy for me to catch their games. Whereas I was able to watch a lot of Texas Tech games there in the 2000s. And I really fell in love with that spread four wide, passing the ball all over the yard style of offense. I had interest in other offenses always, which, I mean, look at this channel. I mean, it's it's kind of apparent. <laughs> I got really into studying the West Coast offense there for a few years, and I went through an old Bill Walsh playbook, and uh, me and you used to go out in the, in the street. We would drive up and down our neighborhood block uh, running West Coast plays, and that was a lot of fun. 
And that's kind of where I started getting deeper and deeper into it. Uh, at one point, we were playing, I think it was Madden 10 or it was Madden 11, and we would have an offline franchise, but we would each take over two teams, and we would take over a whole division. I think we took over the NFC East, yes. and one of us was controlling – the Eagles and the Giants. The other had the the Commanders and the Cowboys. And each one of them, we I had a spreadsheet where we are we modeled each one of them with a different GM strategy, a different offensive strategy, a different defensive strategy, and tried to build them different ways with different personnel types. So I think the Giants were like a run heavy team with a forty six bear defense because they were Giants. So I had to do the big bad guys all over the field. And then the Eagles, I think, were like a spread passing team because, you know, Andy Reid built that team for that around that period. And every team had its own, like, kind of identity. I think the Cowboys were Air Coriel because of the Aikman era. And it was a lot of fun. And uh, that's kind of kept evolving, that, that kernel of what we were doing there. It led eventually to uh, – the 32 man league I run that originally was called one league to rule them all. And then as we expanded to having two leagues, he said, well, that name doesn't make sense. <laughs> so we ended up rebranding it in USFL and USFL has been running um, since Madden 25. And we're still going right now, late into the cycle in Madden 22. So that's kind of been my background with uh, a lot of that. Do you have a, any specific follow-ups to that you'd like? Yeah, so w whenever you were evolving and kind of learning and, and honing in all these different schemes, how did you find that the run and shoot kind of captured your soul? Number one, I have nostalgia for it because it, I, I grew up, like I said, with those Warren the old Oilers Moon days. Oilers teams, which were just so alien in the landscape of football then and even today. They were you know, purely in four wide. The only even carried a tight end for like long snapping and on the, their punt formation. That was the only tight end they had. And he wasn't really a tight end. He was really a, an undersized guard. They, it, it just was a very different than what a lot of other people ran. And when I, I saw Texas tech doing something similar years later, it wasn't the same. The leech air raid is, is a completely different system, but also from that same kind of platform, but now in the gun, something just clicked for me. That was the way to go. As I started studying more, I got involved. Um, first, I found the website called smartfootball.com, which is somewhat defunct now. And they had a lot of different articles about a lot of different offenses, especially spread offenses, but pro offenses as well. And they would deep dive into Chip Kelly or into, you know, how Dana Holgerson game planned or how he installed his his offense in three days. And I, I really was fascinated with a lot of the content that that website was putting out. And eventually there was an article because it, it had a big impact on me. It was called Hemlock's Comment on Spread Offenses or something to that effect. And it was this guy, Hemlock, that was that was his handle on, or this his username on this website called Coach Huey's. And uh, the guy who ran Smart Football had a long conversation with him, and he kind of got permission to condense those that conversation down into an article form. And the article basically made the case for why 10 personnel was the way to go because it just – it answered a lot of things. And this guy had been a coach of run and shoot teams. He'd coached air raid teams and spread teams. And he had found that 10 personnel was the way to go. Well, that got me wanting to find this guy. So I ended up getting on coach Huey's and I eventually found him. I had my own exchange with him for over several months where I asked him all sorts of questions. That rabbit hole led me to finding a, another group that was out on the internet of message boards that was nothing but run and shoot and air raid nuts but the run and shoot guys were the ones that really were, were the most interesting and they had the most content that was really riveting and finding out all of the the secret and hidden plays that no one in the world knew about like divide i knew about the divide play years before it ever leaked out or was you know more widely known and now as one of my our, my buddies uh johnny mighty in our server, 
he posted on Twitter his own diagram of the divide concept the other day. And it's something I wish they would put in Madden. It's what Tua basically uh, won the national championship with Alabama, was on running a version of divide from the run and shoot there at Alabama. Saban had introduced it because it was Tua's favorite play in high school when he was a quarterback in the run and shoot. So I, I kind of fell down that rabbit hole and learning these schemes and Two of the coaches that were in that message board that really had the biggest impact on me was Coach Wayne Anderson, who was the offensive coordinator of the SoCal Coyotes, who almost no one's ever heard of probably, but they were a a semi-pro football team in the United States based out of Southern California that uh, went on a tremendous run of going undefeated and just blowing out everyone in their league for a couple seasons running the run and shoot. And he had been the offensive coordinator there. And he's the most humble guy that just shares everything willingly. He has no secrets. He's a great teacher, patient, kind. Everything you could say great about a coach is pretty much personified in him. And the other one is Coach uh, uh, Mark Poston, who uh, coaches up in Virginia. And he is he was originally a split-back veer guy that got tired of when he was down – 30 points late in the game and having no ability to have a comeback. And he ended up starting with dabbling with, Oh, maybe I'll add a run and shoot package. Well, that run and shoot package ended up taking over his whole offense. I hope to have him on here and he can tell his own story uh, it, it, for a later podcast. But those two guys especially were a major influence on me. And, and I, I would ask them 11,000 questions, anything I could think of. Hey, what if you did this? What if it was like this? Why do you do it this way? And just learning the offense from from these two guys that have ran it, just uh, it was the best thing ever. Because I, the more I learned, the more I fell in love with the run and shoot. And I've been an absolute fanatic now for probably ten or twelve years about the run and shoot. And I've gone back and I've rewatched all those old Oilers games that I'd seen as a kid, and just said, "Oh, that's cool." And now I'm like, "Oh, they're running." Z choice on that play. I wish there was an Oilers playbook somewhere in the ether that would get leaked one day. There's never been any content about what specifically they were running, what specific variation on the run and shoot they were running. They were definitely running a version of it, but I, I would love to know what their specific flavor of it is. Because one thing I found as I've been studying the run and shoot is that there's, every coach has their own unique spin on it, and that's probably true of most offenses, but with an offense this unique, it, every variation is 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 drastically different in, in certain ways. So the for my money, the, the, the basic way to, to break it out is you have the original Mouse Davis version. I, I call it the original. Technically, the Tiger Ellison invented the run and shoot in the 60s, but the modern idea of what the run and shoot is goes back to Mouse Davis in the late 60s, early 70s, who had gotten the book by Tiger Ellison and adapted it to kind of his flex bone offense he had been running. And over time, most of the flex bone stuff got jettisoned entirely. And what was left was a four wide option route passing offense with a minimal running game. And that's what's kind of moved forward through time as the run and shoot. The, the exact plays have changed over time. Um, Mouse would run a package of five basic pass plays. He ran the go pl- go co- route combination, the choice route combination, and slide. Uh, those were his trips packages. Those were the only three plays he really ran from trips. But he would switch up who ran which route in each one of those plays. So he had different tags he could add to make the, the second receiver and the third receiver and trips so swap uh, routes and make it even more complicated. Uh, the big innovation that, that they really had in the run and shoot was that all their routes converted. So it could be a dig. It could be a post. It could be a, uh, a curl, it could be a fade, all depending on what the safeties and the players around them were doing. And then they came up with different rhymes and, and different tricks to try and teach that, but it's really about attacking leverage. So if that safety's coming down, well, then you're going up. If the safety's coming over, then you're going inside of him. If the safety's staying put, then you're staying outside of him. Wherever that safety goes, you pretty much just go the other 
The quarterback knows what you're going to do based on repping it a thousand times in practice, and he can know where to put the ball on the money. That's really what it comes down to is just making the safeties wrong no matter what they do and attacking coverages by spreading the field sideline to sideline and then dicing them up. But in order to do that, you know, different teams have had different ways of doing it. So John Jenkins with the Houston Cougars in the late 80s with Andre Ware and and David Klinger, and they they had they broke all sorts of records. The the first African American Heisman winning quarterback, uh, the Andre Ware. I mean, that's a whole episode that I could do probably there on his his turnaround there at Houston. Uh, but that offense was very much like the Art Bryles offenses are have been in the last few years with Baylor. They wanted to put the receivers as wide as possible. They wanted to stretch the defense as wide as possible because John Jenkins believed. That if you spread the defense far enough, all coverage essentially has to turn into man coverage. Like that guy might be in a hook, def- uh, hook zone, but if you're spreading the field so wide, he has to essentially play man on him. And if you know he's going to be playing man on him, well, then now you can just queue up your favorite man beating route combinations. You don't even have to worry about having an answer for zone if you can just stretch him far enough. So he would start putting his receivers way out near the sideline, kind of like Art Bryles later would do with Baylor. And you see it today with some of the offenses like Ole Miss, Arkansas, uh, Tennessee, now under Josh Hopel. They all do the these same kind of things where you spread them really wide, and if they go out wide to defend it, well, then now you have a light box. You're going to run on them. Oh, well, now they're bringing guys into the box to stop the run. Well, now they don't have leverage on these receivers. And they're – they're just going to make you wrong no matter how you try and cover it. There's always somewhere they can attack. So that's how John's offense kind of evolved. And then there's June Jones, who's personally my favorite version of the the deal. And what he really did is when he was hired by the Houston Oilers in 1987, I believe, he said, okay, we're going to take the three best run and shoot plays that we have. And we're going to take three of the best, uh, three of the best concepts from the Bill Walsh West Coast offense, and we're going to merge them together, and we're going to run six pass plays that are the best six pass plays that we believe in, and we're going to really sell this. And they at first the uh, the team called it the Red Gun offense, and over time it, it has evolved and, and mutated more towards the run and shoot than it ever had that West Coast element. But a lot of that West Coast element remained. And later, even when June got to Hawaii after his stint in the NFL finished in 99, he was the temporary head coach after they had fired uh, Gilbride. And June's decided June was offered the job to be the head coach of the Chargers. And he turned it down and he went to Hawaii and became their head coach. When he got to Hawaii, he had several meetings with Bill Walsh and really redefined some of his packages, tightened up some things. And that offense since has been kind of consistent in terms of what they do. There hasn't been that much that changed. And honestly, you could probably go back and watch his stuff in Atlanta, and it's probably not that different either than what he ran with like the Houston Roughnecks and the XFL back in 2020. Not a lot of it has changed. There's been innovations and tweaks every year. I think every coach tries to say – you know, hey, what can we, what worked, what didn't, how can we make it better? And there's always tweaks year to year. And that's definitely true of June's stuff. But what I love about June's is he, he really focuses on really three or four main, main pass concepts. He, he, he focuses on the levels play, which is something he added in new. He got that from the, the Bills K gun in the, the early 90s. And in a lot of ways, it, it's kind of like the old choice play from, the Mouse Davis version, and but all the routes are more static. You know exactly where everyone's going to go, but you can change who's running which route by several different tags. And that that's somewhat in Madden pretty well. They have versions of it in Madden where the the deep dig route is by the number three in trips, or it's by the number two in trips, and then the other two guys on that side are running quick unders underneath it, and it really stretches the defense because they. They have to cover both of the unders underneath, which we're, are going to give a horizontal stretch because they're at different depths. If the middle linebacker jumps on that first guy across, that second guy across has no one to pick him up. 
So someone has got to pick him up. At the same time, there's a deep over on top of it that now they're stretched vertically. And it's something every kind of zone defense is going to have issues with. And with all these short in-breaking routes, that's pretty good against man too. So if you one of those guys should come open versus man, and versus zone, you should get a pretty good stretch. And June found that that play was probably his most efficient play he was running. So he started to phase out some of the other stuff. Now, they still run a lot of the older Mouse Davis plays still, too. But Levels has replaced a lot of those reps. If you were to go and look at the 1985 Houston Gamblers or the 84 Houston Gamblers, over half their plays were just running the go concept and the choice concept from trips. Whereas if you were to go watch any of June's plays from the last few years, you know, it, it's a lot more of the levels package, the streak switch package. And what I would roughly call the flood package. They have several plays that are, that are flood plays uh, that I would put into a, a separate group. So a package is, when you group three or four concepts that all have the same rough parts, but who's writing what part kind of changes. So, or where they're aligned changes, but the learning is largely the same. If you learn what your route is in this specific concept, where you're lining up and who's switching with who doesn't really change much. It's amazing to hear so much history about the run and shoot offense. And one thing that I'm getting, even as far back as it goes to the early days with Mouse Davis, is that there's a lot of where people are taking what they already know about football. And once they realize that they can implement it in this strategy that spreads everything out and gives you a win option on any play, there's different ways that they can go with it. How would you say that that ties into your knowledge and your usage of the run and shoot going back to the early days when you were teaching me about the West Coast offense and the timing principles and, you know, the studying that you've done on the air raid? How would you say that all of your other schematic knowledge kind of pours in and, and seeps into the way you use the run and shoot? The thing that's probably the most different for me than what a lot of other people do with the run and shoot is I, I really love the tempo aspect from the air raid. And I, I definitely have brought that into how I approach the run and shoot. I, I like that when you're in no huddle in real life and in Madden, it, it really limits what the defense is able to do. They don't know when you're going to snap it. You could snap it really fast. You could sit there and wait on it a minute if you need to. Uh, but when you're playing with that tempo, you, you're tiring out that defensive line. They're getting exhausted. Now, they're not able to win and beat your O-line up as much. And then in addition, the defense is not going to be sitting there calling some long play call. They're going to be in their hot routes. They're going to be, okay, we're just running basic cover two. Oh, we're just running basic cover three. We're just going to have to run, oh, oh, cover six. Like They're not able to do 15 setup. They're not. On, de on defense and Madden, you can't make 30 adjustments before the snap. You know, so that that aspect of it, it keeps the, uh, the defense a lot more vanilla and the pass rush much more at bay, which to me are all positives. That, that can apply to almost any offense. Well, I've just taken that from that air raid module and applied it to the run and shoot. It's something that uh, they actually tried to do with, the SMU Mustangs in 2013, June brought in Hal Mummy, uh, the inventor of the air raid, to be his uh, assistant offensive coordinator and, and help bring some of his knowledge of the air raid to the run and shoot. And they added mesh and they added a couple other things. They, they looked at a lot of the plays and they sat them down and looked at them side by side. And they found a lot of their concepts kind of matched up the the big difference between the air raid and the run and shoot was in how they protected so in the air raid traditionally they wanted their o-line as far apart as possible they would be four or five feet apart and, and this would make defenses because defense is aligned based on the technique on the offensive linemen so that would spread the defensive line further out and they found that if they did that that meant those defensive ends that are now coming off the edge they're going to take an extra second to get to the quarterback. Well, that just bought them the time they needed for their passing game. So that's how they dealt with 
well, if we're going to have five out on a route, how are we going to protect the quarterback? That's how they decided to do it. They spread out their O-line, and surprisingly, it worked pretty darn well for a long time. And they, they, some of the area teams still do that. Other teams have evolved different manners, and some of a lot of the more recent air raid teams have now moved to just running the ball a lot more to keep the D line more at bay rather than Mike Leach, who was throwing it 80% of the time, you know, 15 years ago. Whereas the run and shoot dealt with the pass rush by doing an angle drop from the gun or a half roll from under center, which kept the quarterback on the move and away from those edge rushers. But he brought in Hal mummy to help bring some of those ideas. And one of the things he really wanted to do was to move more to tempo because the problem they had with the run and shoot is that the play calls were really big and, you know, they, they wanted everyone to be make sure they were running the right thing. And June had never really coached a, a no huddle spread team. So bringing in a guy who had already run a, a no huddle fast as can be passing offense from spread sets, there was a lot of commonality there. It made a lot of sense. And they did pick up tempo, you know, bringing him in. Um, but I don't think they've I've ever seen a run and shoot team that really runs at the tempo that uh, a well-oiled air raid team does, especially Mike Leach's. So that's the one thing I, I specifically have brought to it from my own background and from I really ran the air raid in Madden before the run and shoot was an option. And then for years when the run and shoot plays were available in custom playbooks, I kind of ran a hybrid. I had, had Y cross and I had shallow cross and I had mesh and all those kind of plays mixed in with my run and shoot package. That hasn't really been available uh, since Madden 17 onward. They, they took away that, that ability. Um, hopefully we're going to be able to do that again here in the future. But I think there were memory issues with the custom playbooks that were causing the custom playbooks to uh, become overloaded and then no plays load correctly and it would cause games to crash or it would cause all sorts of weird bugs. They had to remove the alternative playbooks plays from the custom playbook uh, creator um, in twenty in Madden 17, I believe. So hopefully that they, they get to a point now that we're all on next gen for the most part where they can they can fix that and update that. Well, knowing EA uh, by Madden 37, we should uh, we should have that patch done. So we should have the <laughs> updated playbooks by then. Uh, speaking of plays, can you walk us through a specific play? Maybe a, a play that you love or a play that schematically uh, is one of your favorite, uh, how it's run and how it works into the scheme, how you can kind of play off of that. Yeah, absolutely. So going back to the June Jones example and who, I mean, a degree as well, the Jenkins version, both versions really love the play streak and all the variations you can do off of it. And we kind of went over what a, the, the air raid play six came as well from the, that's the play the, the most came from the run and shoot. And I believe Hal has even said at times, he took a lot of his plays from the BYU offense in the 80s when they had Steve Young and and all those guys. But six, he took from watching the Houston Gamblers play when he was at, coaching at Copras Cove. And that was really the team that I think put the idea of four verticals on, on the table. And the Air Raid version is a different variation on streak. It's not the same, same exact thing. And Madden, it largely is in the game is, is four verticals. And I don't think four verticals is exactly what six is or what streak is. But you can use it for that. And we are that's what Coach Vaughn talked in episode two about was specifically how to adapt four verticals to play kind of like the Air Raid six. Um, with the run and shoot, they originally called it touchdown. <laughs> That is a great name. Yeah. Everyone's running a street. There's a lot of confidence. Sure in the seventies, no one had really seen that kind of concept. Uh, it probably resulted in touchdowns. That's why. But that kind of play, I think it, when it probably came out, would have been viewed more like a Hail Mary play, not like a play you would call on first and 10. And I think that was one of the things that really set the run and shoot apart is, they're willing to run this play anywhere on the field, any down, 
And one of, one of the things I love the most about the run and shoot is I feel like you're you're always in a game. You can always make a comeback. Unless it's fourth quarter, two minutes left, and you're down three scores, you can come down you can come back. And it doesn't matter what down or distance it is, any down, you can pick up thirty yards. It is possible. This offense has the the options available to always be able to pick up those big plays. So one of the plays specifically is is the streak and the switch package. I group them together because they really are the same thing. So I made a uh, playbook for running the run and shoot for high school teams back in 2020. And I put it out on my run and shoot 101 group on Facebook that I run. And here are a couple plays that I'm going to put them on the screen now that um, are from that playbook. And really the the thing that that stands out to me is that they're the same exact play streak and and 90 streak and 90 switch streak are the same play the only difference is the x receiver on the far left he's gonna now gonna run the slots route and the slot is gonna switch outside and run the route that the x receiver is supposed to run that's the only thing that's changed so really when you teach this offense in the high school level you're going to teach every receiver two routes first and foremost. In my opinion, this is how I would teach the offense. I would teach inside street greed, and I would teach the outside street greed. Once you've learned those two, how, how we're, those routes are going to be throughout everything else we do, especially that inside street greed. And that inside street greed is going to read off of the safety. And like I said earlier, if that safety rotates down, well, then you're going to maybe go flat past him. It's all about attacking that leverage. And there's 11,000 ways that can play out based on how that safety is specifically playing. But that's what he's going to be keying off of. If that safety is dropping way deep in single coverage, then you're going to maybe cut that dig underneath him. If it's single high, but he's staying really close to the box trying to play the run, then maybe you run a streak and run right past him. Whatever he does, you're going to make him wrong. So we're erasing him from the play pretty much as long as we make our reads right. And then the outside guy, he's going to be basing off the corner over him and what the coverage is. So if that corner is way off and he's immediately backpedaling, well, then you're going to break it on a nice little end and you're going to look for the the ball to hit you in the, in the numbers. Uh, you're going to find a nice soft spot and you're going to you know kind of jog in place waiting for the quarterback to get you the ball. But if he plays you really tight, well, then you're going to go over the top. And if he plays you outside and he's really trying to protect that sideline, well, then you go way up and then you post it inside and you run a a, a deep post and leave him in your dust. Whatever he does, you're going to go the opposite. And they have another variation on it called 1415, which 14 is just the left hand version and 15 is the right hand version. Um, But with 1415, it's like a hitch steam concept. It's the same idea, though, except now the outside guy has the option of he's either going to sit it down on a hitch, he's going to run up on a little fade stop where he runs 12, 15 yards and then breaks it out, or he's going to run down the pipe, depending on what that corner does. So everything is just going to be reading off of what the safeties and the corners do, and whatever they do is going to be wrong. As far as your your underneath coverage, your linebackers, your your uh, slot defenders, your apex defenders, they're, they're going to be running the under coverage. And we have plays that will attack that as well. We'll have flat control routes. We'll have routes that, you know, maybe go out and just go out there to, to pull those guys down. We want to keep them out of the play. But what we're really attacking is that back coverage. And it doesn't matter what they're running. What the run and shoot guys really found was that there was really only five options. Uh, in terms of coverages you would see you could you could run 30 coverages out there let's be clear but they all essentially as far as we were concerned with the back four guys there's really only five options there's two high man there's one high man there's two high zone there's one high zone and there's cover zero really that's all there is it's just a matter of how you're getting to it so even with something complex like quarters which coach scott talked about last week Quarters doesn't doesn't scare us because essentially what quarters is is cover zero, but with uh, you have two underneath zones that are playing the flats. 
which is cool, you know, and, and it has really good leverage and it's not purely just running cover zero. But at the end of the day, you have your safeties and corners, more or less, figuring out who they're going to match up in, uh, in man on and then matching up and playing man. And maybe if everyone runs, you know, slants, then maybe they'll drop into a deep quarter. But for the most part, they're just going to play man across the board. So if it's man across, well, we have we all know what the routes convert to versus man across. And so everything will just convert right according to plan. And what's better about quarters, it, it really compared to cover zero is with those two guys in underneath flat zones, which aren't stopping us any because we're not looking to throw really in that area that much. We're essentially getting cover zero with no pass rush help. Like the biggest benefit of cover zero is at least you're bringing six. In this case, you're not. Now, if they do bring six, well, the run and shoot in real life has blitz conversion. So a lot of the routes you'll see uh, short little dash lines in. Well, those short little dash lines in are for what happens if it is cover zero and everyone's coming on a blitz. Well, suddenly everyone says, hey, get open now. And the quarterback has knows exactly where to go to. They rep that specifically. How to beat cover zero is one of the first things run and shoot teams have to have answers for. Because when you are sitting there with no tight end, no fullback, only a running back in the backfield, that gives you a maximum of six guys that can block. So any team is going to say, okay, let's see what happens when I bring five. Let's see what happens when I bring five and do some crazy stunts. Let's see what happens when I bring six and really challenge that running back to block. So, can everyone hold up? What if we bring seven? And, I mean, that's really nuts. If you're bringing seven, that means you only have one guy manned up on each of those receivers. That back could maybe free release and score a touchdown because no one's covering him. You know, but teams will, will sometimes try and be really aggressive with the blitz. So you have to have answers. I have a video from last year where I kind of detail how the run and shoot likes to address that and how I, I implement that in Madden. Um, but that, that's really one of the, the core things. Then you have two man and you have one man, really that could be three match. And, and to some degree that could be like uh, cover, cover four palms could, can kind of convert into a version of two man. You just need to have an answer for what, you know, how you beat that. And then when it comes to any other coverage out there, it essentially comes down to some version of two high man or one high man or two high zone or, or one high zone. So once you know that that's all you really have to do is beat these five basic coverage families and you, you have route combinations that you know can attack all of those deep and then you have different combinations of routes you can mix in underneath that keeps the underneath guys busy and, and not focused on what you're actually trying to do. It really opens up that deep passing game and you can really find ways to leverage open guys, especially when your routes aren't static. Your routes are changing and dynamic. So – with streak, it's really, you know, like it sounds, on the you have a strong side and a weak side. The quarterback is always going to roll away from the guy that has the option. He rolls away from that guy. That guy with the, the inside streak read, which we have one version of four verticals in the game that has that, and it's not even right. It shouldn't have a curl. It should have a dig instead of that curl. Um, but it, it is what it is. You, you'll have to live with <laughs> what they give us. Um but it's in pistol spread, and what you'll end up doing is you, you, the quarterback will half roll the other way. And really, you're just going to try and set up behind the tackle. You're not trying to boot it all the way out to the sideline. You're not even going to look to doing anything like that. But you're going to do a little bit of motion that way. And the, the running back is going to b- help block on that side, and it's really going to open up everything. You're going to do ha- kind of a half slide blocking technique towards the right. And it kind of varies Madden to Madden. In Madden 21, I was able to get it to really work well by sliding the line to that side and then uh, using the double team mechanic. And then you can set the, uh, the mic to a certain player. There was a whole setup I had to it. We'll see how it works in 23 because in 22, it wasn't easy to set it up. But you need to be able to roll to a side. So that's one thing the run and shoot does different than the air raid. The air raid does those wide splits, like I said, to buy the quarterback that extra second. And the run and shoot, they put the quarterback into motion on this half roll. Or from the gun, it's more of an angle drop, where instead of the quarterback dropping straight back, he's sidestepping over to the side instantly for three or four steps and then throwing on time. Three or four steps, throwing on time. That's kind of the, the rhythm of how it should work from the gun. 
And that gives the quarterback that extra second because by the time he's throwing it, now that end that from the weak side that's coming around, he's now going to go a little bit further. Now on the front side of streak, uh, with streak normal, it, it's just it's a lock streak on the lock fade outside, and it's really a lock seam on the inside. But it can break into a out route if there's a cover zero uh, blitz break. But that's not in Madden, so you would you'd have to identify cover zero pre snap and then switch him to being an out. But that's going to be your front side read. The back side is where you're going to have your inside streak read and outside streak read. Now the outside streak read isn't in Madden. I wish it was, but with the new pass leading feature in Madden 23, I was able to play in the beta. And what really got me excited was that you are now able to put the ball outside of the wide receiver's typical path and the receiver will bend their route, especially on these deeper routes to go get it. So you can essentially make that streak. Now what the run and shoot calls a take two post or that, that, that deep post on the outside where they run 15, 20 yards and break inside. Well, now, if you were to throw that deep streak down the, the sideline and pass lead it hard to the inside, now it will break like a post. The other thing that's different is if you, you have the, the inside streak running that post route and you bend it way down, it'll run almost a dick. So now we have a lot more ability to make those receivers run the correct reads. When we read them as the quarterback, we can just bend the ball and, and, and put it where only our guy can get it based on how these plays are supposed to work in real life. Now, where that gets even more exciting is, to me at least, with streak. The switch streak is essentially the same thing, like I said, as 90 streak, but the the two backside routes are flipping they're going to switch their releases and the outside guy is going to run the inside guy's route and the inside guy is going to run the outside guy's route. But everything else is going to stay the same. Now in Madden, switch has always been pretty much depicted as a post wheel concept, which post wheel is how the NFL and other pro style teams said, oh, wow, we like this switch play. The run and shoot teams are running. How can we bring that to our offense without having to teach receivers all these option routes that take a lot of time? Oh, well, we'll just make it a post wheel. And so the post wheel is a locked uh, version of Twitch. And I really wish they would add the option routes. That's one of the things I have personally written numerous times to AW, the uh, guy who really is in charge of the playbooks for Madden. And I've written him several times about how we really need Switch to have conversions. It, more than anything else, even if it was just a seam or post by that 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 in breaking route, it, it really would be huge. But now with this pass lead feature, I was able to test it in the beta that that inside breaking post that is typically there in that post wheel play. You can now pass lead it up and it will run up the seam without any kind of weird hitch or any kind of weird motion. He will just he will inside release and then run straight down the seam. Now, when that's really good versus mm. like a cover one where that safety plays low because he's waiting to, to jump some route. Well, now you can get way down the seam versus that really well. If you have a guy that can just beat his man one-on-one -on -one. and that's what that, that play is really great at doing in real life, but it's not really been that way in Madden ever. And I think it's going to be real exciting. I think one of my first videos here, once 23 is out, is I'm going to be testing Switch every which way, trying to get it to go. The other thing I really like about Switch is that the front side is really modular. So early on, they realized, okay, we have this backside concept. It's great, but the Switch takes a really a few seconds to open up. And it's really better if those backside reads are your third and fourth read as you're going through a progression. So they said, okay, well, this front side isn't really getting open that often, this lock seam and this lock, you know, outside fade. So they started messing with the idea of putting something short on the other side. So the first version of that was what they called uh, the read play. But I, I have it in my high school book here is 90 streak switch Z read. And basically replaced those two streaks on the front side and, and replaced it with, the slot guy is going to run just to the flat immediately. 
kind of like in the go play or, you know, it's just a flat route. He's going to get out there immediately. And then the guy out there is either going to, he's going to read the corner and he's either going to run his streak like he normally would, or he's going to run like a deep slant. And so it essentially can become a slant flat concept or kind of a play that's kind of like a, a fade out kind of play, um, which can really attack different coverages different ways. It's really just there to give the quarterback, if he sees an easy completion there, take it. You know, and, and the quarterback's going to be rolling that direction, so that's a shorter pass for him than anything else. And if that flat's not covered, dump it off to him. It's a, it's an easy five yards, move on to the next play. If that slant is coming in over the top, well, then throw it. And so that was where it kind of started. But really over the last 30 years, a lot of different run and shoot coaches have said, this front side could be anything that's just a quicker read. So some teams have ran a curl flat over there. Some teams have done smash. Smash is a really good one, and that's one that's that Madden actually gives us stock. Some teams do a hitch steam over there. Some teams, any kind of short combination. You can, you can put levels over there. You can put any combination you want over there. You can put drive or anything that's two routes. You can do double slants. You can do whatever your heart contents on that side, as long as it's a quick progression that attacks something that you feel that you you don't like attacking with switch. So that gives you something quick over there, and then by the time you say, okay, I don't really like it, I don't really like it, if nothing is obviously open on that front side, then the quarterback flips his hips as he's finished his half roll, and now he's looking at the backside. And is the wheel there, or is that, that inside streak read there? One of those two is going to be there, and that's kind of how, how streak works. Wow. What what really strikes me about the run and shoot is that it's, you, you can't go wrong if it's executed properly. I mean, if you're if you're just a West Coast offense calling slants and you're reading a cover zero blitz to you're trying to get something out quick and then they drop into cover two and now everything's covered underneath. You, you kind of don't have any options at that point other than, you know, throwing the ball away. But with this offense, people are reading. You've got the hot routes in case there's a blitz. So, you know, either way, you're, you're kind of covered. Why why don't we see the run and shoot utilized more often? What what weaknesses can there be in an offense that has an answer seemingly for anything defensively? I, I think a lot of it had to do with <laughs> – it's complicated. complicated. <laughs> in, in the 90s, there it had it got a connotation for being a finesse offense and – just for context, when I was writing my wide zone scheme guide I put out last year, uh, I was really fascinated by when Mike Shanahan was head coach of the Raiders in the late 80s. And very quickly, Al Davis and him clashed. And Al Davis found Mike Shanahan's offense to be too finesse and not real power football and that it would not have any staying power in the NFL where you had to play power football if you were going to have a chance at winning championships. And he was Al Davis. He knew. He won championships. And who's this Mike Shanahan guy who lost all those Super Bowls with John Elway? This was in 1990. So just for context, since then, right. Al Davis has done nothing. And Mike Shanahan and his whole coaching tree has been to like 10 Super Bowls. And, you know, the wide zone is the most physical – offense in the NFL today. So I think if the run and shoot had come out today, I think it would be viewed very differently. When it came out, it was viewed as, whoa, 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 no, no tight ends, no fullbacks. No fullbacks was a big deal in 1987. Like, that was a big deal. Teams were all in I form. No one was really in gun much, you know. And now here's a team that says, okay, we're going to go four wide. It, it was very unorthodox. And it had – decent success but anytime it had any failure you know everyone was quick to say oh look Steve told you it, it sucks uh, it really did pretty good at all levels the, the Houston Oilers were by far the best example because they had the best quarterback and the most sustained success they had an organization that was actually committed to running it for or some variation of it for about seven years which is unheard of comparatively. The The closest example other than that would be the Falcons in the mid-90s. And even then, I mean, I think one of my favorite run-and-shoot teams in the pros was the 95 Falcons. 
Um, going back and rewatching them, I didn't really follow the Falcons as much at the time because I was an Oilers fan. But as an adult, I've gone back and rewatched a, as much as you can find out there of the, those mid '90s Falcons run and shoot teams, and they were so much fun. I think one of my favorite running backs of all time, really, is, is Craig Hayward, Ironhead Hayward, who was this 260 pound. <laughs> Six three running back <laughs> was in the run and shoot, and it's like, oh, okay, four wide, and here's this guy the size of a guard who's gonna run right up the gut and run over the linebackers. Like he was a behemoth. Um, it, like that was a really fun team to watch. And that year they had Jeff George, and Jeff George was actually like on program and doing what he was supposed to. The the when he came in there, June told him, hey, if you can. Keep your nose down. Work hard. You know, don't don't come begging for you know big contracts or any of that. If you just do that for three years, you're going to hit the free agency market and you're going to be the top quarterback everyone's going to be coming after, and you're going to get a big payday. But you have to stick to the program. You have to be here early. You got to work late. All that stuff. Well, he did that for two years, and and in t- 1995 was a huge year for that team and for for Jeff. Jeff had almost a, an MVP type year that year. And then sure enough, he goes to the owner and says, okay, give me a new contract or I'm sitting out. <laughs> and he like, sits out all the trading camp and then he loses the whole locker room. And then he comes out week one and says, okay, I'll play. Never mind. And then he just, it, it, he couldn't get the locker room back. It all imploded that 96 team ended up only winning, I think, four or five games. And it was just – he he got kicked off the, the field, I think, like week three or four, and they ended up starting backups instead, and it all just spiraled out of control. And it's all sad because a lot of that core of that team went on to play in the Super Bowl just two years later in 98. Like, it wasn't like that was a bad team. They had Jamal Anderson and a lot of those other guys that would go on and be in that Super Bowl. Just, you know, they needed to get that quarterback situation figured – and, you know, they, they went with the, the cheaper option of, of Jeff George. You know, they had had Favre there a few years earlier. June was his quarterback and coach in OC when when Brett was there. And the problem with Brett there was that he wanted to go out to the clubs drinking all the time and showed up late to meetings and to practice. And, you know, he, he would go out drinking before games. And, you know, he wasn't the starter. He was the backup. But you never know what's going to happen in the NFL. And they traded him specifically to Green Bay because they said there's nowhere he can go drinking and get into trouble other than, you know, the the small biker bar down the street. You know, there was nowhere where he could really get into trouble in Green Bay. So they traded him specifically there for his own benefit because otherwise they were like, this guy's going to be washed out of the league. And sure enough, he goes on to become one of the, you know, the greatest quarterbacks in NFL history who didn't know what a nickel defense was until uh, his like 10th year in the league. But, you know, whatever. You know, uh, may- maybe they shouldn't have done him that favor in retrospect. Uh, you know, the Packers went on that run for 20 years. Maybe uh, may- maybe the Falcons should have sent him to San Diego and saved himself yeah. some trouble. Uh, it- it's it's interesting you bringing up the... 1996, they have the Jeff George drama, and they can't win enough games, and June gets fired. Meanwhile, Brett Favre is winning a Super Bowl against uh, the Patriots. <laughs> It's funny to think about Ironhead Hayward, this big 260-pound running back, because I'm seeing some parallels now. We've got defenses that are spread offenses in the NFL, and we get smaller and smaller defenses where a lot of linebacking cores now really look like safety rooms 10, 20 years ago. I wonder if we could possibly see a resurgence of some of those big power backs pounding it up the gut against some of these sub-defenses. Maybe... Uh, run and shoot revival coming down the pipe. Well, and that's really something I always look for, and uh, when I'm team building, my quarterbacks, I like them to have a cannon. I like them to have some mobility if they can have it, but it's not really required. The biggest thing to me is they need to have a big howitzer of an arm. Ideally, the lowest I've ever worked with is an 89 throw power, but if I can have it, I like 93, 94, 95 up. You know, if I can, I want the biggest arm I can get because I, I'm going to be throwing it down the field all day. And what 
I found at least is having that higher throw power. It's not going to make the biggest difference necessarily in distance, but it's velocity. So if I'm throwing that 20 yard, you know, corner route or that 20 yard post over the middle of the field, if I can get it there half a second faster, that's a difference between maybe a DB getting a hand on it and being broken up or picked and my guy catching it cleanly. Like that can be a huge difference. Um, but to pair that with, I also want receivers that can get to the catch point as fast as possible. And so I, I really do value speed. And some of the, the guys in the league like to think of me as being a, a speed whore. And it's not so much about I want to stretch the field all the way down the field. You know, I'm talking about running streak and switch, two very vertical concepts. It's not that I so much want to see my guy 50 yards down the field making a catch. It's that I want him to get from – his stationary point to the catch point as fast as possible. If he can get there faster than the defensive coverage can adjust and tweak, and I can hit the, that seam just a second earlier, it increases the chances of me making a catch. And then also increases the chance uh, after the catch, I can make a bigger play after. So for me, it's really more about, I want a quarterback that can get the ball there as fast as possible. I want a receiver that can get to the catch point as fast as possible. So we can really, you know, put a lot of pressure on the, on the defense as fast as we can. And then like you were saying off of that, I like having that huge power back. I, I really, uh, I fallen in love a long time ago with power backs. I think for a long time, I was a speed back guy as well. I loved Michael Bennett on those old Vikings teams and, Warwick Dunn and Clinton yes. Portis and those guys all were really a lot of fun and they all I think had 95 plus speed CJ2K was another one I really loved he was like I think 100 speed in one man I, I think um, yeah th those guys were all so much fun but I think the, the one that made me the two running backs that made me fall back in love with power backs and you know one of them but I'll, I'll tell you the one you, you might not know first the, the, the one you don't know is Steven Jackson uh, late in his career. He was in Atlanta and I, I feel like it was like maybe Madden 15 or 16 was when he was in Atlanta and he had already started regressing and no one liked him because they looked at this, this running back and they're like, Oh, he's an 84 speed. He's too slow to use. And everyone wanted the guy that's 95 speed. And so I said, okay, well I signed him out of you know, free agency to, I think I was running an air raid team at the time. I was like, well, you know, He's got good ratings, and he, you know I'll see how I. Oh my gosh, he he was like a revelation. Just he was so dominant as a runner. And then the other one is you, you want to say the name or do you want me to? Go, go ahead, brother. Charles Scott from LSU. <laughs> cheat was, code, unstopable. And, and he was a cheat code, and like NCAA eleven, I, I want to say or twelve. Or he was in all of those. Right. Around you could only hope to contain him. Like, and we would import those draft classes over into Madden. And whenever he we imported him, he always became the biggest monster ever. And I was so disappointed when he got drafted and he was drafted to the Eagles in the sixth round and they moved him to fullback. And then they traded him to like Arizona and then he, he flamed out in camp and like he ended up not going anywhere. But in for like a brief minute there, man, like those NCAA rosters, when you would import them, like he was the nastiest Mm -hmm. running back yeah i think he was only like 230 pounds but it, it gave me a taste of what you know maybe playing with jim brown would be because he had like i was gonna say the same thing and he was like 230 he was super strong he would just roll over guys like um he, he was so much fun yeah the, the other guy i thought you might mention was Najee davenport back in the day Yes, he was a lot of fun. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, my, my first love of a running back was probably for Earl Campbell. So right. um, when I was in, I think, eighth and ninth grade when I was playing, uh, was when, right around when Ricky Williams came out and there was the cover with, with him and Ditka getting married and, you know, all that stuff was in, you know, the media. And there were so many comparisons at the time of, of Ricky to, uh, to Earl that I, I, I really fell back in love with Earl and then I fell in love with Ricky and I, I love pretty much a lot of 
the stuff Ricky Williams has done since. He's a pretty cool dude. Uh, from what I can tell, I, I don't follow him on social media or anything. I don't know. Maybe he said something and he's canceled now. I have no idea. You never know what this stuff <laughs> He's not. Ricky's but, still uh, cool. <laughs> Ricky's still cool. Good. He, he was down with, uh, you know, marijuana before everyone else was. But, um, yeah, no, I just, I, I've always had a soft spot in my heart for power backs, but really the last, you know, since Steven Jackson, especially, uh, I've gone out of my way to try and get them. And one of the, the guys this past year that has just been, uh, everyone that knows me, I think in Madden, or in any of my leagues knows that you can't let me get this guy. But the the Cowboys have a running back slash fullback is how I think they have him listed. He's one year pro. He's well, he's going into his second year, I think. And his name is Steve Alano Lua. And he is 240, 6'3, and he's like a, a 63 overall. But you know what? He's got like 82 break tackle and 80 tra- trucking and good strength and he's 84 speed and i love getting that guy and making him a huge weapon what i really like about that position in particular is i really feel like you need a guy that can is good in pass blocking you need a guy who can catch and he can do both of those things really well uh, i've got a million questions for you scheme guy on all day but I, I just want to thank you for taking the time to break down the run and shoot for me i came in a novice and now i feel like i've got a feel like i'm conversational on uh, on the run and shoot thank you for tuning in to the talking schemes podcast you can find it wherever you catch your podcasts we're on spotify we should be on itunes all the major podcatchers If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you hit the subscribe button, like it, share it, comment below, all those things. We have a Discord server. If you would like to ask any further questions, you can find me there. And I do have a new run and shoot scheme guide coming out for Madden 23 that I've been working on that a lot of this content is going to be kind of focused on in there. So if you have further questions, that may be exactly what you're looking for. Until next time, take care.